Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are talking about One Piece. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may be looking at the name in the channel, Retro Rebound Modern Game Review, though. What's going on? Look, this place is the anime hotspot at this point. We talk a lot about DBZ. We talk a lot about Naruto. There are many more anime video games I want to dive into. So it only makes sense that when Bandai sent me One Piece Odyssey early, that we would upload our One Piece Odyssey review here. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And for those who are looking for more nostalgic retrospective stuff, we're going to be talking about One Piece Grand Adventure on the release date of One Piece Odyssey. So fret not. We got a balance here, as all things are in this world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have been really looking forward to One Piece Odyssey because I am a new One Piece fan. I just started watching in the last year. Your boy's 100 episodes deep, and I'm mad at myself for waiting this long because I love One Piece. Shout out to my man Sanji. Sanji, best boy. Love what he's doing here. And now I get to run around as Sanji in a turn-based RPG. Are you kidding me? Sounds like a match made in heaven. But I had to hold back my hype for two reasons. Number one, would Bandai deliver here? Anime games can still be kind of hit or miss in today's industry. But number two, as someone who's only 100 episodes deep, could I enjoy One Piece Odyssey? And that comes on two fronts. Could I enjoy it without spoiling myself? Could I also enjoy it without knowing much about the rest of the series and some of these characters that are party members like Robin, Frankie, Brooke, and so on? Well, I'm going to answer that and much more in today's video. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're new here and you're into nostalgic and retrospective content, you're in the right place. If you like the occasional modern game review, I got you covered. Now, let's get cozy, board the Going Merry, or the Sunny, depends on what ship you're thinking about, and let's set sail into One Piece Odyssey and talk about what this game has to offer. Now, first and foremost, the thing I want to address is that this game is undoubtedly a breath of fresh air. I really like One Piece Odyssey because it's just something different in today's anime video games industry. Look, I love what Cyber Connect's doing. We're going to talk about Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, funny enough, this week. But the reason why they're relevant is because they sort of have popularized even more so the 3D anime fighter. As long as it's flashy, good looking, and has very little depth, you can sell your anime video game. And so we've seen copycats like, oh man, One Punch Man, oh, my boy, that... That is not a good game. Or, oh, uh, My Hero One's Justice. I like the first one, but the second one was pretty mid. So we really have a spotty history with these types of anime games. So when I see one dare to break the mold, my thought process is you must have an idea here. And One Piece Odyssey certainly has ideas and explores new ground in turn-based RPGs. How do they do that? Let's leap into the combat a bit. So it's pretty standard turn-based combat for the most part. You have your attacks, you have skills. Everyone uses TP, that's the currency, to spend and do your skills. And these skills are moves you've seen in the anime, like Zoro doing Onigiri. Or you have Luffy doing Gum Gum Bazooka and going into Gear 2 and so on and so forth. Like You have these things you've seen before. They're done on a higher production value, and I love that type of stuff. But I think what the defining quality of this combat is are two things actually. Number one being the areas. So typically in turn-based games, you have your whole party line up on one side of the screen and you have the enemies line up on another side of the screen. And they kind of just stand there doing their idle animations as you pick whatever move you're gonna do. Now what's interesting about One Piece is in fact they are big 3D areas and you'll have groups of enemies in different pockets of the arena. So for example, you have maybe Luffy and Zoro in one instance teamed up against three bronze bats. And then you'll have Nami and Robin in another pocket fighting maybe a single enemy that looks like a lizard. You get a lot of those moments there where battles are broken up into different areas. Because these skills, the reason they're useful is you have skills that are long range and skills that are close range. And so what happens is maybe you're in one pocket of the arena and you'll do a ranged attack and throw your cross at an enemy and hit them across the arena while you have other enemies up close. Now what'll happen is there are different moves you can do that let you switch areas. So maybe you'll take Zoro and move him to the group of Nami and Robin and have him fight along them because that group of enemies is particularly overwhelming. This is defined by a triangle system very similar to Fire Emblem. It just has a different naming convention. You have power, you have technique, and you have speed. And all of your party members address these sorts of needs. And what I love about this game is they don't have you earn these particular party members. Like, you just start off with the full party. Everyone from the One Piece family is here. Everyone is here ready to fight. 
and they kind of just address your needs there and then. Certain characters are power, certain characters are technique, certain characters are speed, and you just kind of swap them in, swap them out, depending on what you need for particular combat scenarios. Now, given that the game gives you all the answers like that, that does lead to one problem with this game, which is that it can be very easy in the early going. Very, very, very easy. In fact, there were some moments that it was still fun, but combat was like rinsing and repeating a little too often. And I don't mind when you get into that rhythm in the later game, because usually that's the product of a good build. But this game, it's like, here's everything. Uh, go crazy. And I don't, again, mind that in particular. It's just, man, I wish I could have earned some of those challenges. Now, as you start to venture into different areas, some enemies become a little bit more spongy. They start to require more tactics. Some of the bosses are really interesting. So I like how it gradually progresses over time. Just those opening hours know that if you've played turn-based games before, it's going to be pretty easy. And I think that's by design because while I would say it is easy to understand I consider myself a bit of a turn-based RPG aficionado. That's like my bread and butter. And so when I had to take a moment to really wrangle the system in and, and understand it properly and let it marinate throughout a couple of battles, that's when you know, as if you will, a veteran of the game, that you kind of have something new here. Because typically these formulas are established, they're familiar, and there's some wrinkles in there that distinguish it enough, but it's kind of what you've come to know and expect. But when it came to the triangulation system, the moving of uh, party members from area to area, the swapping of them, understanding all these mechanics took some time. And I felt like, and I don't say this with an ego, by the way, so don't take it the wrong way, but if I had some trouble kind of coming to grips with it, then someone who's newer to RPGs may have some of a tough time. So it's good that those opening moments are easy because you're trying to figure things out and i think that can occupy you long enough for me once i came to grips with it i was rinsing for a while and again as i went from that location in the starting point of the game to a new area i was like okay now it's starting to ramp up a little bit here but it does take some time like three four hours to really get to that point where you're being challenged within these battles are also events which i thought was really cool so it'll say for example defeat the boss with luffy and if you beat the boss with Luffy, you get like double XP. Like you get significantly rewarded. And I really like that because it were it became these almost stories within combat on how I could accomplish these little events that were ongoing. Not a big deal for many, but I thought it was pretty cool. There are other interesting wrinkles. Like for example, Luffy can't be paralyzed because he's made of rubber. Small details like that, I think, make games special. Uh, Zoro, when he's running around the overworld, doesn't have a map because of all the jokes that are made in the manga and the anime. So little things like that are peppered throughout the whole experience. Uh, Chopper can only fit into smaller areas. I just, I love that type of stuff. To me, it gives the game personality beyond what's there at face value. And it doesn't have to be there, but they choose to put it there, which to me shows some intimacy with the source material, with the characters, all that stuff. So there are wrinkles like that that you can come to appreciate. Now, as you're completing these battles, you're going to get XP as you would in a standard RPG. You're going to level up. This game does commit what I would typically consider a cardinal sin in RPGs, which is you start the game off with all these skills, all these amazing things, and then it takes it all away from you. I typically hate that, but because this game has good progression, you get a lot of it back pretty quickly, and because its mechanics feel new to me and fresh to me, I personally didn't mind this. So as you're leveling up, you're getting these skills. You're going to find them through cubes, and these cubes can be invested into these skills to make them more powerful, make them cost less. The other way of leveling is through what I thought was a pretty cool accessory system. So it reminded me a bit of, I think it's Battle Network 3, where you could like reorient ships and kind of slot them together on Mega Man.exe on how you want to actually level up your character. And so what this means is the accessory system is much of the same. Each accessory takes up a certain amount of space on the board. Some accessories take up the entire board and they'll give you different gameplay buffs. And so as you progress in the game, it becomes a challenge of like, who do I want to give X amount of accessories to and how do I want to allocate them? How do I want to fit them in? And there is that satisfaction of eventually like rotating pieces and having them all click together. So there is something cool there. Now, when you're not in combat, you're going to be exploring the island of Wofford. This is this legendary mystical island. And we'll get into the story in a little bit. But as you're exploring, you'll learn that this is a very linear style game. Now, what I will compare it to, because it's pretty great timing since I just covered it at the end of December, uh, it reminded me a lot of Naruto Rise of a Ninja. Now, not 
open world in that sense, but interactive in the same sense as Rise of a Ninja. So what I mean by that is, if you didn't see the video, there are moments where Naruto can do a shadow clone jutsu and knock down a rock, and behind that rock is unique loot, and you can only access certain parts of the map if you properly level up your party and get the right skills. So the same thing kind of happens here, although it's a lot more linear. Like, there'll be moments that you think you can go somewhere, but there's an invisible wall, and you'll find a magnifying glass nearby, and it almost feels like you're walking through you know, a zoo or an aquarium where you're like, oh, look at that, look at that, but you can't, like, go into the cages and, and touch the animals and say what's up or anything like that. Uh, so what you'll be doing is exploring these pretty linear pathways, but certain aspects open up as you'll zip around with Luffy, as he'll just stretch his arm out and bring you to new heights, and you'll find treasure tucked away in unsuspecting locations, and that's where the exploration starts to feel pretty good, and then you'll start to learn certain characters can only access certain areas, so you'll find a metal gate, and only Zoro can take that down. You'll find, as I said earlier, a small area, and only Chopper can crawl through there. And so, suddenly these dungeons, these moments of exploration, take on a life of their own. They're a lot more fun to go and do. Not that they were ever boring or annoying, but you start to feel out why things are linear, because the level of interaction that each character has is kind of what gives it its flavor. And so I like it. It feels like everyone's traveling together rather than it's just Luffy and then everyone shows up for combat. It's like, no, certain points Zoro's useful, certain points Chopper is useful, and so on and so forth. And for that, I really do appreciate it. Now, combat is initiated in these dungeons through an advantage system. So if you sneak up behind an enemy, you'll have the advantage, or as this game calls it, the initiative. If you are to hit them head on, it will just be an even battle. And of course, if you are surprised, uh, they'll have the initiative. But what I want to shout out is actually the dungeons. I, I thought the dungeons were surprisingly thoughtful in this game. I, I was very surprised with one of these dungeons where I was like manipulating these lightning barriers and opening and closing doors and just shutting down parts of the dungeon to open up certain other parts and finding little secret passageways. I was like, wow, okay, so this this is great. Like This is the full-on RPG that we were looking for. I again did not expect any of this but it's there and it's it's awesome it's way more awesome than it ever needed to be given the standard the bar being very low for anime games but it's also just a pleasant surprise and again i'm hoping that standard is being set for other developers like for example i'm a huge demon slayer fan for those who don't know and if we could get a demon slayer turn-based game like this i would lose my mind man i read that manga from start to finish i would lose my mind but we got another cyber connect 3d fighter which looks amazing but isn't what i am trying to connect with on a deeper level uh now speaking of connecting on a deeper level let's talk a bit about the story as always spoiler free that's why we kind of keep the story stuff in the back end and when we do talk about it i don't keep it vague so to say but i don't go all in on narrative details so to put it simply it's an original story with two brand new characters being audio and Lim, who are on this mystical island called wafford and you'll be able to explore this entire island go through every single crevice of it and you're going to eventually explore memoria and these are the memories of each of the characters in one piece and regain what is effectively lost with all these new wrinkles in the story now what i will say about the game's story is that there aren't any english voices so if you are looking to fire this up and hear colleen clinkenbeard or hearing christopher sabat or any of the familiar voices that you know and love that will not be here, unfortunately. No English voices in the game, just the Japanese. I don't think it's bad, though. I think the Japanese voices are still great, but I just, I love that English voice cast. However, what you get here is almost a revisit of certain One Piece arcs in the overall story with new wrinkles in them. So to answer your question, ultimately, can you play One Piece Odyssey and enjoy its story if you know nothing about One Piece? I would say you're actually in a better position than someone like me who's kind of got one foot through the door. Because if you don't know anything, then it's all just new to you, being introduced to you, and you have very little context. But the game does expect you to know the history of these characters. Like, one of the first places you go to is Alabasta, one of the most popular arcs in the show and in the manga. Now, I like this arc a lot, but that happens to be the arc I also most recently finished and this was a great feeling out point for me on like, how much are they going to ruin? And frame one, they fire up the story and they're like, so this is what originally happened in Alabasta from top to bottom. And because that's established now, anything that we see that's different is thanks to Memoria, pretty much. Okay, got it. But 
now as someone who is about 100 plus episodes deep, I'm going into it now thinking, well, Arc 2 is like Marineford maybe, and I don't want that ruined for me. So if you're going in blind, blind, you're actually probably better off than someone like me who's kind of part of the way there. And that's a little frustrating because when they were pitching it as an original story, I was really hoping they'd find a way to make it truly accessible for those who maybe are even watching. Because One Piece is so popular, but there also has to be some level of understanding like, Yo, there's a thousand plus episodes of this business here and uh, more on the way. And it's wonderful because from what I've experienced so far, pretty much all of it is amazing. It's just, that's not something I can say, okay, I'll spend a month, catch up, come back. So there is the spoiler risk here in this game if you are halfway in. And there is technically the spoiler risk if you're going in blind and don't want to know anything about the show. It is not an original story on that front. And to that, it is kind of unfortunate. But what I will say is that my enjoyment of Alabasta was strengthened to the high heavens because of all the little references and moments there and certain characters that were appearing that typically weren't there on the adventure and the throwbacks for them. It, it was a lot of cool stuff tucked in there, so I appreciated it for what it was. But just know that you can get into this and you can play at your own risk. But for me, I'm kind of in that awkward position of, how deep do I really want to go here after Alabasta? Because what I played, I love. Like, this game gets my full stamp of approval, but I am, I'm just terrified because I don't want to ruin what is kind of peak fiction right now and one of the most fascinating stories in anime because it's just so long-term and so much of it is consequential and so much, of it, so much of it has payoff that you never would have expected. So it's this awkward position that you just have to feel out for yourself. But for me, if you're asking from like a game point of view, the quality there, is it worthwhile? Like, yeah, the answer is yes. I, I think what you have here is a really fun RPG that introduces a new mechanic, lets you tackle battles differently. The exploration is solid and rewarding. I think the progression is enjoyable. The story is there and interesting and they represent the characters well. Like they have all their personalities down to a T, uh, but you're just gonna have to decide at your own risk how much you want to be spoiled or not. And if you have already caught up on all of One Piece, you're in business, man. Like, you got a great game here. Just, you may trek into that territory of, I've seen this before. And for that, it can be unfortunate for those players. But that's where, again, Memoria plays its factor. And certain things change based off the memory of what occurred. But it still, overall, will be retreading familiar ground. So that's my review of One Piece Odyssey and my thoughts on it. Overall, awesome game. Check it out at your own risk. With that, ladies and gentlemen, take great care of yourselves. Let me know your thoughts of One Piece Odyssey in the comments down below. And I'll talk to you in the next video where we're going to discuss One Piece Grand Adventure. Be well, and I'll talk with you soon. Peace out.